Today, we finish the Northern Ohio Crusade here in Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, where the Cleveland Browns and the Cleveland Indians play. This has been one of the great crusades of our ministry. We came to this city with doubt, fear, and trembling as the Apostle Paul said he went to Corinth. We had been told for years that Cleveland is a hard city. We had been warned that Cleveland was the graveyard of evangelists. We had been warned that church life in Cleveland was very low. We had been told that the churches would not support the crusade. We had been told about the great social problems of this city. We had been warned that black people could not attend the crusade because of fear of leaving their communities and homes at night. We were told that the youth of Cleveland, unlike the rest of the country, would not respond. All of these pessimistic predictions have now proven untrue. We've averaged nearly 40,000 people a night during the past 10 days, and have averaged over 1,500 a night responding to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. At least 15% of the audience every night has been black, and the overwhelming majority of the people have been under 25 years of age. The scriptures teach that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. We have seen the abounding grace of God in this great city of Cleveland, Ohio, during the past 10 days. The two newspapers of Cleveland, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which has the largest circulation of any newspaper in Ohio, and the Cleveland Press went all out to support the crusade, giving front page coverage every day. The television and radio stations have given more coverage here than any city that we've been to in a long time. Thus, this weekend, the entire city of Cleveland and the people of Northern Ohio are thrilled and excited about the response that they've witnessed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It has come at an unexpected place in an unexpected time. For nearly two years, the Christians of this area have prayed, worked, and prepared. Now God has honored their dedication and their prayers with an overwhelming victory. Thousands of people in Northern Ohio today are singing praises to God and declaring, to God be the glory, great things he has done. During this past week, hundreds of young people have been throughout the Cleveland area witnessing for Christ. They've won scores to Christ, and some of their testimonies are thrilling. We've also conducted a school of evangelism for a thousand seminary students and pastors. We believe that a deep and permanent work of God has been done in Cleveland, and as one civic leader said, there's a new spirit in Cleveland today. Some time ago, a European philosopher said, if we could capture the youth of the world with a Christian ideology, the world might yet be saved. Certainly in northern Ohio, thousands of young people have been captured by the magnetism of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, youth today is yearning to be and to do and to attempt and to achieve. Adolescence is a period of adventure. Every young man or girl is a Columbus of a new world. Normal, full-blooded youth pulsates with the zest for living. Youth must find self-expression for all its developing powers of brain and body. The yearnings and longings of youth generally find expression in some slogan or watchword or some personality which crystallizes its quest for modern life. Particularly is this true of modern youth movements all over the world. Behind these slogans is the quest of youth to express its eager enthusiasm in some worthwhile job. Here in Cleveland, we've seen youth mobilized for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, scores of radical youth organizations have stirring and challenging slogans that have gripped the hearts and imaginations of radical youth everywhere. The youth of today are marching in China under the red banner of Mao Zedong. Jerry Rubin said the other day that there comes a time in history when radicals must join with liberalism to reach a radical objective. He said that time in history is now. A few years ago, we heard the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Italy, the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Japan, the tramp, tramp, tramp of the youth of Nazi Germany. These youths were directed by their leaders to a bottomless pit of destruction. Once again, we're beginning to hear the tramp, tramp, tramp of young people. Which direction are they going to go? Which direction are they going to turn? Some are turning to Jesus Christ. Some are turning to Satan worship. Some are turning to drugs. Some are turning to all kinds of political action. Modern day youth faces the tragedy of inevitable destruction and even annihilation 
unless the course of these marching millions is toward God and the kingdom of God. These youthful marches, as in every generation, eventually march against one another. To meet on some frontier in mortal combat, they need only to continue marching in the wrong direction. If and when they meet again, the world will stand on the brink of utter destruction and annihilation. It will be the world's Armageddon. It is my prayer that the youth of the world on every continent will be captured for Jesus Christ before this takes place. Youth usually marches at the call of personalities rather than programs. Today, they are marching after both personalities and programs. Sometimes they seldom know or seem to care what it's all about. They marched for Mussolini without really knowing what it was all about. They marched for Hitler without really knowing where Hitler was going. Youth marches often at the command of overwhelming personalities who make vocal the issue and visual the program. I'm becoming more and more aware of the fact that people change people as much as ideas change people. The power of personality is strong. I could give many illustrations today to prove that personality many times is greater than ideas. Such is the case when we turn to Christianity. We find the secret of the power of Christianity. The secret of the power is not in Christian ethics, although Christianity has a system of ethics. The secret of power is not in Christian ideas of philosophy, although Christianity has a philosophy. The secret of Christianity is found in a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. Men have found other philosophical and ethical systems, but they have not found another Jesus Christ. No one in history can match him. We are now living in a period of great youth revival and involvement. They are motivated toward social reform, toward politics, toward dope, toward sex permissiveness, and even toward Satan. There are other millions of American young people who are now motivated toward Jesus Christ. They found new songs and new slogans to shout. They are beginning to march for Jesus Christ. Many of these young people who are searching for the real Jesus by going to see such things as Jesus Christ Superstar may be missing the real Jesus. One young person said that Jesus was the first hippie. Another had a sign that said Jesus was a cop-out. Both of these are wrong. Jesus Christ was the Son of God who died for our sins and rose again from the dead for our justification. He is the living, reigning Son of God. The mark of a true Christian, as I spoke about last Friday night, is found in his personal relationship to the personality of Jesus Christ. Christianity is Christ. Christ is Christianity. I speak reverently when I say that Jesus is more important than his ideas. Both are true. But all that he said was true, but without him, even the truth would have been powerless. Men know the power of truth, and truth makes men free. But Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. And again he said, if the Son set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now no personality in all of history stands above Jesus Christ. Agnostics and atheists have found fault with the Christian ideas, but they can never find fault with the person of Jesus Christ. They found fault with Christians, but they can never find fault with Jesus Christ. Christ transcends methods, ideas, and followers. He stands at the turning point of time. Men everywhere must bow to his superiority. Christianity is Christ, and those who are going to be Christian must accept and follow him as a person. He and he alone is able to meet every need of the human race today. One of the problems in the church is that we have called people to a program rather than to the person of Jesus Christ. The greatest need in America today is for young people to arouse themselves and to follow the flag of a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The Bible declares him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He took upon himself the form of a servant and humbled himself even to the death on the cross. God became man in Christ. He moved among men. He went about doing good. He made the blind to see and the dumb to speak and the lame to walk. He not only showed but provided mankind with a new way of life. He presented the greatest social manifesto the world has ever heard in his famous Sermon on the Mount. His death on the cross was voluntarily born in the love which he had for the human race. He died as a substitute for all races. He shed his blood that our sins might be cleansed. 
And on the third day, he arose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of God. He lives today. And I'm offering to the young people in America and throughout the world on this program that you do not serve a dead Christ, not a Christ who's still on the cross, not a Christ who is in the grave, but a living, resurrected Christ who is leading an army of young people on every continent to ultimate victory. We have the promise that someday the victory shall be ours because he is the captain of our salvation. Today, we need young people who have dedicated themselves to follow this living Christ to death if necessary. This past week, thousands of young people here in Cleveland, Ohio, have given their lives to him and pledged themselves to follow him all the way. Young people but the millions in America this summer have the assurance that in this topsy-turvy, bewildered, reeling, staggering world that they're on the winning side with Jesus Christ. The Bible declares that he's coming back again to take his rightful place as King of Kings and Prince of Peace. This is the only hope of this world of despair in which we live, the hope that Christ shall someday reign and the whole earth shall be subject to him and his prayer, thy kingdom come, shall have been answered when his kingdom shall cover the entire earth. On a great banner of one of Hitler's youth encampments, there appeared these words, the highest duty of German youth is to die for the fatherland. Christ demands no less. Jesus Christ demands all. Youth does not want to be called to a life of ease. Youth wants something hard. Youth wants a challenge. Youth wants something to live by and something to die by. Youth needs and wants a voice and a leader. Many people have an idea that they can be a Christian and live any way they like. This is not the call of Jesus Christ. To follow Christ requires discipline. The words of Christ search deeply into the hearts of our souls when he says, He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Later, he amplified that statement of divine principle by saying, If any man will come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brothers and sisters and his own life also cannot be my follower. In other words, Jesus Christ said that if you have to forsake all, even your own life, then you'll have to do it in order to follow him. Yet in other places, the Bible says that we're to love and cherish parents and brethren and sisters and children. What then did Jesus Christ mean? He meant that we're to count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. He meant as Paul meant, I count them all but refuse that I might win Christ. In other words... We are to make Jesus Christ supreme, permanent, preeminent in our hearts so that no person and no thing shares that place in our lives. No price or parents or loved ones or possessions of life itself are too great for his sake. To be a follower of Christ requires you also to bear a cross. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross daily and follow me. Again, he said, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross that he is talking about is not a cross on which Christ suffered for our sins on the tree. For we can add no part to the price of redemption. It is not the bearing of an outward cross around your neck as we see many times. It means the denial of self and all that life has to offer in full surrender to the will of God. The world may dazzle us, but it is dim in comparison with him. Thousands of you listening to my voice today on every continent can volunteer for the army of God with the assurance that in the end you will be on the winning side. All that you have to do is to surrender your heart to Christ. By faith you receive him into your heart. He will forgive your sins and give you such an inward peace of soul, conscience, and mind that you will find for the first time in your life that you're really living. Young people, do you want to live life with a capital L, life with adventure and fulfillment? Come to Christ today. Find purpose and meaning in him. Give him your heart and start life anew. Follow his flag. Serve in his army. Yes, it will mean that you take up the cross. It means self-discipline, self-denial, and cross-bearing. But then comes the victory and the crown and the glory, the joy, the peace, and the satisfaction that you'll find in this life and then the life to come with all the excitement and adventure of another world. It's all yours if you put your faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we pray that many people this day will come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and will follow him 
no matter what the cost, for we ask it in his name. Amen.